In this lecture, we will learn about the thin films and coatings, how they are being applied on the surfaces of the bio, uh, bio implant devices and materials to enhance the cytocompatibility of all those devices when, once it is incorporated into the body. Uh, generally, the bulk properties of the uh, device materials, they, uh, they are somehow designed to ensure proper design and fabrication of biomaterial uh, devices for certain applications, certain properties such as appropriate mechanical properties. Uh, in terms of durability, it can also incorporate the corrosion resistance and even the functionality of that particular device. So, the bulk properties dictate the appropriate mechanical response, chemical response and the biological response once they are in inserted into the body. Such as hip, hip implant, it has to withstand very high stresses that the structural requirement. Hermio dialyzer, it requires very good permeability and then ag again that is again a fabrication requirement and artificial heart, it needs flexing for millions and millions of cycles. So, we can see a variety of such requirement by hip implant, hemodialyzer, your heart implant. So, in terms of uh, withstanding either high stresses or high permeability or even flexing for millions and millions of cycles. So, we can see the bulk properties are being dictated by the functionality or the properties of the material itself, the bulk uh, the properties of the bulk material in it itself. But once it has to interface with the biological uh, entity, the environment, it has to be incorporated with certain surface layer. So, in order that the overall bulk properties, they are maintained at the same time, we enhance the interaction of this particular device with the surrounding material. So, that is that is the reason, that is the critical reason that we require thin films and coatings. So, this thin films and coatings, they can render biological response to biomaterials and devices while maintaining the mechanical and functionality of the device which has been now placed into the body. So, the thin films and device, they get dictated by the surface chemistry. So, the overall response of this uh, uh, device, it gets dictated by the surface chemistry and the structure. And the idea of applying this thin film and coating to retain the key physical properties of the biomaterial, the bulk properties are now being maintained while modifying its bio interaction with the body. So, in the process what happens, we are applying thin films, it will retain the mechanical properties, they remain unaffected, but it is interfacing with the tissues and the cells nearby, that is now being modified because of these thin films and coatings. So, we can see that thin films and coatings, they can render biological response to the biomaterials and the devices which are placed inside the body, they are dictated by surface chemistry and structure. So, we can somehow tailor the surface chemistry and the structure in order to curtail or enhance certain response of this device with the surrounding uh, tissues. And uh, in the process, it retains the key physical properties of the biomaterial. So, it does not affect the mechanical properties and the functionality, but it modifies only the bio interaction part. So, the thin films and coatings, they can render enhanced cytocompatibility. So, it can modify the uh, biocompatibility while un, uh, while maintaining the mechanical properties of the device. Uh, certain modifications uh, are required such as it can be surface modification. So, uh, surface modification can include blood compatibility. So, in certain cases when we require the blood, uh, the comp the blood compatibility, compatibility uh, with the inserted, inserted device, we can utilize a silicon containing block or copolymer additives. So, uh, or siloxane polymer de deposition chemically modified polystyrene and pl or plasma fluoropolymer deposition. So, these are certain uh, materials which can be utilized uh, for enhancing the blood compatibility with the device material. So, these are being applied as a coating onto a device material to enhance the overall interaction and without letting the blood clot or uh, inducing thrombosis in those particular regions. Otherwise, device can in induce certain uh, toxicity, it can also induce uh, encourage uh, thrombosis near those regions where the device has been inserted. So, this induce, induces the blood compatibility by certain materials such as silicon containing block copolymer, siloxanes or chemically modified polystyrene or even plasma fluoropolymer deposition. And in certain cases when we require cell addition and growth, so once we want the material, when the device is being inserted into the body and we want it to become an integral part of the, uh, part of a particular organ itself, so it has not to be encompassed with the cell. So, cell should adhere on the surface and they should get, they should just basically engulf the overall uh, entire machine for a nice uh, anchoring. So, cell addition and growth can be can be encouraged uh, such as by oxidized polystyrene surface, 
ammonia plasma treated surface or plasma deposited acetone film. And these are all uh, which are required for enhancing the cell addition and growth, but in certain cases when we want to reduce the overall uh, interaction of those cells with the entity, because in, in, in that case we sometimes we want to remove that particular device or add something additional on the surface of the device, then we do not want cells to damage the surface of the device material or we, if in case we want it to act as a sensor or, re, or, be, or retain there so that we can analyze the chemical composition of the nearby blood or even the pH value. So, we, we want that particular surface to remain exposed for certain duration of time. So, we do not want the cells to grow onto that particular region. So, in those cases we do not we want to reduce the cell addition on those surfaces and we can utilize plasma fluoropolymer deposition again in certain cases. So, we can either utilize certain techniques or certain composites uh, certain materials to impart that particular effect. Again the surface uh, modification can also be required in terms of controlling the protein adsorption. So, if we want to in, uh, incorporate or want to reduce the adsorption, we can in, impart Im, Im, immobilized polyethylene glycol. We can also uh, impart uh, ELISA dish surface to enhance uh, the overall protein adsorption. Uh, utilizing ELISA dish, there is nothing but enzyme linked immunosorbent uh, uh, assay. So, ELISA dish surface, it can, in, it can impart enhance protein absor adsorption. Again, once we start cross linking the contact lens, it can again reduce the overall protein is, uh, adsorption, otherwise it will basically create a problem uh, in terms of interlocking the uh, surfaces, because protein once protein gets adsorbed then only the cells start uh, coming onto the surface and they adhere to the surface and get adsorbed. So, to eliminate the overall uh, growth of cell or precipitation of uh, certain cells on the surface of a device material, we want to control the protein adsorption and that can be uh, induced by surface cross, cross, link, cross linking uh, such as for contact lenses. And in certain regions we want to improve the lubricity, in case once we have certain joints we want to enhance the lubricity, so that the mating surface do undergo the minimum friction. So, we can impart uh, certain treatments such as plasma treatment, we can also induce radiation grafted uh, hydrogels, we can also induce something called interpenetrating polymeric network in order to su supply, uh, supply nutrients or even to supply the lubricants uh, for re reducing the overall friction between the two mating surfaces or adjoining surfaces. And in some cases we also want to enhance the life of the particular device or an implant. We also want to uh, want to improve its wear resistance and the corrosion resistance that can be achieved by ion implantation or even doing the anodization or diamond deposition. So, we can see by either by diamond deposition or anodization we can enhance the wear and corrosion resistance of the implant or the implant or the device material. And in certain cases we want to improve the transport properties in order to enhance uh, the drug delivery or uh, supply certain nutrients to a certain location. We, we can do plasma deposition of such as methane or siloxanes. In some cases we want, want to have electrical insulation such as uh, in the uh, pumping heart region. Uh, so, in that case we want to uh, when the leads are just coming out we want to have them insulated, so that they do not uh, uh, they do not really short circuit. So, we can do something called plasma deposition, we can also apply solvent coatings or we can also apply uh, paralyzed insulation in those regimes. So, we can see uh, we, uh, we can apply certain techniques for either improving the wear resistance, corrosion resistance, improving the pro transport proper properties, even inducing lubricity or providing electrical insulation. So, these surface modifications become very critical in terms of dictating the functionality or the overall surface interaction of the device with the nearby tissues or the environment or even the fluid around it. And now there are certain techniques which can be utilized for modifying the surfaces of the biomaterials. So, once a biomaterial is being induced uh, introduced into the body, the surface can be modified either by chemical or physical alter alteration of the surface. So, either we take the inserted surface, inserted uh, surface of the implant material or the device material, we somehow change the chemistry of the top layer. In that particular manner we are changing the chemical chemical or physical nature of the surface of the implant directly. That can be done by either etching, so we apply certain chemicals to it and then etch the surface to make it much more rougher. Chemical modification again by changing the chemistry by letting it react with some other species or even roughening, so in, in order to enhance the surface area which comes in contact with the adjoining surfaces or the living environment. So, we can see that we can alter the 
surface of the device itself or the implant itself by altering its chemistry or by its physical nature. And there is second technique, we can somehow coat or allow some different material to get deposited on the surface of the implant material. So, we can either also do, we can also over coat the surface of the implant material or the, uh, or the, or the device material via certain coatings or by implanting certain thin films or by grafting. So, we can see we can have uh, two kind of techniques, either we can go by chemical or physical alteration of the surface or we can also by go by over coating the surface such as by coating or uh, introducing thin films and graft, grafting. So, there are certain techniques. So, if you have original surface, so we can see this original surface is now very much prone for uh, things like corrosion, wear resistance, even the cytocompatibility becomes uh, can become an issue. It can also release certain ions and if you want to impart certain function, functionality, if you want the tissues to get attracted or even the blood, if you want to introduce the blood compatibility. So, we need to somehow modify the surface accordingly. There are certain techniques. Uh, in first case, we can just overcoat the material. So, we have this original surface, original surface and we then overcoat it with certain material to impart that particular functionality. So, in this case, uh, we can apply just some material which can protect this our underlying surface. This is nothing but the original surface and impart certain functionality. In certain cases, we can also introduce a gradient surface because this surface might be very, very inert and if you want to impart certain functionality to it and uh, say if you want to have much more cell compatibility of the surface, but we also want to have the interlayer to be very, very strong and adherent. So, we need to go gradually from this property of uh, not allowing the cells to grow onto it to a very uh, cell active surface, such as going from a very inert alumina, alumina surface, aluminum oxide to a hydroxypirate surface. So, aluminum oxide may provide much more toughening to it, but hydroxypirate will provide much more cell activity on the surface. So, in that particular case, we want to go from 100 percent alumina to 100 percent hydroxypatite. So, we have Al2 300 percent and in this case, we want to go for hydroxypatite 100 percent. So, in this case, we want to go gradually from 90, 80, 70, 60 percent of alumina to eventually come to 0 percent alumina. So, we are providing nothing but a gradient surface. So, that part also can be taken care by using surface modification. And we can also apply certain self assembled layers, these are called Langmuir Bloggate uh, self assembled layers. So, we can provide certain functionality to the surface. So, we can either impart the, we can let the polar head groups stick on the surface and again, so that can basically stick to the fluidic region. So, polar head region will be much more hydrophilic in nature, whereas hydrophobic regions can stay outside, so that uh, it will reduce the overall wetting of the surface. It can be done otherwise also we can let the uh, hydrophobic region get attracted on the surface and then let hydrophilic region uh, uh, come on the top surface. So, we can apply this Langmuir Bloggett uh, self assembled layers for again imparting certain functionality. Then there is one more feature, we can also add some something called surface active bulk additives. In this case, we add certain material in the bulk of this particular original surface and we play with the interfacial energies of that particular additive, that it will have polar heads, it will also have certain tail region. And it happens that we can some, somehow make these particular bulk additives to come and sit on the surface, just by playing with the interfacial energies of this additive and the original surface. So, it can, uh, that, that will be dictated by the overall difference between the interfacial energies of the additive and that of a bulk material and the difference between the uh, interfacial energy of this additive with air and difference between the interfacial energy of this additive with the substrate. So, it should feel much more stable once it is sitting on the surface. So, that interfacial energy has to be much lower than that of a additive and the substrate interfacial energy. So, in the in, in re, so what we are doing is reducing the overall energy of the system by letting the bulk additive come and sit on the surface. So, just by a single processing step, we can allow this particular additive to come on the surface and impart certain functionality to the original surface. We can also induce some something called surface chemical reaction. So, once we have say uh, OH group on the surface, we can uh, some make it react and make it a methyl uh, CH3 group. So, from alcohol o OH, we can go to uh, oxymethyl uh, group on the surface to impart certain functionality. 
So, that is also possible by inducing surface chemical reaction and we can also introduce uh, reactivity by enhance the reactivity of the surface by roughening it or etching it. So, once we have a surface which was very smooth and now we introduce surface uh, roughness on the uh, on the top of this particular uh, surface, then we can uh, we can still achieve enhanced functionality or enhanced surface area which is available for the reaction. So, we can see we have certain uh, surface modification techniques, we can either overcoat, we can apply uh, apply gradient gradient layers, we can also apply Langmuir Bloggett layers for imparting certain functionality, we can add bulk additives to the surface, we can impart certain chemical reactions or we can also enhance the surface activity by introducing roughness to the surface. So, we can see these surface modifications are now possible so, uh, by these all techniques. And once we are uh, coating a thin surface, we are targeting a mono layer of around 3 to 10 angstrom in thickness. And uh, basically to ensure complete coverage, we can go for up to 25 to 50 angstroms of Langmuir Bloggett films, because we, want, we do not want any, uh, any part to remain uh, un unreacted or uncoated. Uh, so, in that case we may want to go for 25 to 50 angstrom. But what happens as, as we go for thicker and thicker coatings, though we are ensuring the complete coverage, but now, but now coatings become much, much prone to delamination, because as, as soon as uh, coatings start becoming much, much and much thicker it starts in incorporating certain stresses, residual stresses and that might lead to its breakage. So, minimal thickness of this particular coatings they ensure uniformity that it is uh, nicely uniform, it is durable and it is also highly functional. So, we can see the thin surfaces they are basically targeted in the range of 3 to 10 angstroms and to imp uh, ensure the complete coverage we might even go for 25 to 50 angstrom thicker layer, uh, but thicker coatings have problem of getting delaminated or getting cracked. So, that is the reason we want to go for thin films which basically ensure the durability, uniformity and the good functionality of this particular surface. Uh, in order to, remo uh, to reduce the overall delamination de or enhance the uh, resistance to delamination, de what we can do? We can uh, provide certain covalent binding of the modified region with the substrate. So, instead of only Van der Waal forces or electrostatic forces to cover the surface, we can also impart certain chemical reactions and induce certain chemical or covalent bind, bound, uh, bonds with the surface. So, we have surface bound, uh, bound with covalent bond to the uh, applied coating and then in the process it makes it much much stronger. And we can also uh, enhance the resistance to delamination, delamination by intermixing uh, components. So, in first case we had substrate which was now chemically bound to the outside or the surface species. In this case what we do? We do intermixing the components of surface substrate and the surface films. So, in this case it is more like a gradient layer. So, we have this component, it has now good affinity with itself. So, we will provide some degree of bonding with the surface film. So, in this case we have substrate and now the coating is approximately of the similar material, then we put one more layer and then it is again of a different kind. So, but in the process what we are doing, we are intermixing the components and by intermixing the components, we are inducing some sort of a interaction between the substrate and the surface film. Third thing is, we can also introduce some sort of something called primer layer at the interface. Primer layer of at the interface is again more like a glue, which can react again with the surface film to provide much more strengthening or resistance to delamination to the surface film. So, we can introduce primer layer at the interface to again impart resistance to delamination. Additionally, we, what we can do? We can also incorporate functional groups. So, if I have a particular layer, a particular substrate, we can up, uh, impart certain functional groups, which will bind strongly to the surface film. So, in the process, this functional group, this functional group can impart much more stronger bonding with the surface layer to the substrate by acting as an interlayer. So, so we can see there are so many uh, techniques of improving the resistance to delamination. First, we can bind the uh, surface layer covalently with the substrate. Secondly, we can also intermix the component of the surface and the substrate or we can introduce something called primer layer to enhance the bonding or we can also introduce something called functional groups to improve the bonding between the substrate and the surface layer. At the same time, once we are uh, introducing a surface layer, 
we want to retain that particular surface rearrangement. If the surface guide starts getting rearranged, it might even break, it might lose the structure, it might lose the functionality as well. So, we want to retain the surface rearrangement the way we wanted or the way we had planned. So, first of all we can uh, re reduce the movement or reduce the rearrangement part by cross linking the modified surface or we can also sterically block the movement of surface. If we can allow, if we construct the ch uh, chain in such a manner that it is not, uh, the, the overall movements are not possible sterically, the overall uh, organization of the chain itself does not allow any further movement. So, in that particular way also we can somehow block the movement of surface. We can also introduce impermeable layer between the substrate and the surface. So, again we can impart a barrier between the substrate and the surface, so that the arrangement has been, arrangement can be restricted. And again after we have done all that, we also need to characterize the surface and ensure that the intended surface is really being formed. Otherwise, the overall device makes uh, of no use because uh, we want to make sure that the uh, intended surface is exactly it is really forming. It is not that it is getting rearranged to a different structure and getting damaged. So, we want to re re restrain the surface rearrangement and that we can do by cross linking the surface and uh, somehow sterically blocking the movement of surface structure. So, chain the uh, arrangement of chain itself uh, can be in such a manner that it does not allow any rearrangement or also in introducing something called impermeable layer between the substrate and the surface in order to do, uh, to, to uh, minimize the movement. And after we have done that, we want, we also should ensure that indeed uh, intended surface is indeed being formed on the surface. And there are certain methods of uh, surface modifications. So, we can see, uh, we can modify the surface by something called uh, chemical reaction. So, we, what in the chemical reaction, what we can do? We can make the surface react with atoms or molecules at the surface. So, somehow we are now letting the surface atoms which are sitting on the surface of this particular device, let them react and then form something else. So, we had say OH group, we can make it react to form OH CH 3, O CH 3. In this case, it was much more uh, hydrophilic in nature and once we start introducing uh, CH 3, it becomes hydrophobic in nature. So, just by chemical reaction, we can change the overall contact angle on this particular surface. So, in this case, the contact angle will be much, much lower. In this case, contact angle of the, this thing will be, uh, will be very, very higher. So, we can see the contact angle is greater than 90 degree in this case. In this case, contact angle is much less than 90 degree. So, that is, uh, that can also be induced by utilizing chemical reactions. And again, the chemical reactions, they are generally, they generally form mono layers. So, they do, they do not overcoat with the reacting species. So, we do not want, if you are reacting it with certain species, we do not want it to settle down on this particular surface, but they just form a single mono layer on the top of it and they should not overcoat with the reacting species. Again, we can distribute different functional groups at surfaces. So, in some cases, if you want to have a surface which, which can take both hydrophilic as well as hydrophobic entities, we can impart functionality by introducing certain areas which will be specifically hydrophobic and other areas which will be specifically hydrophilic in nature. So, we can see these areas can be totally hydroph hydrophilic and other areas can be hydrophobic in nature. And if we introduce some, uh, some surface, uh, if, we, if, if we let any entity come over it, it will now be able to trap both hydrophilic as well as hydrophobic entities on its surface. So, we can impart biofunctionality to the surface by somehow distributing different functional groups at the surface. So, if water comes, OH will bind it, if any polar region or oleogroup comes, CH3 might bind it. So, by chemical reactions, we can somehow react the atoms or the molecules which are sitting at the surface and we can distribute different functionality. Uh, by using this particular groups, but at the same time we form only mono layers and we do not overcoat uh, with this particular reacting species. And there is additional method of uh, modifying the surface is by radiation grafting. So, by radiation grafting, gra in radiation grafting we utilize cobalt 60 and we impart UV radiation and which is nothing but a high, very high energy elect or we also utilize very high energy electron beam. In the process they are doing nothing but breaking the chemical bonds. 
the bonding between the atoms can or molecules can be easily disrupted by utilizing C6, C6, uh, cobalt 60 or ultraviolet radiation or even using high energy electron beam. So, we can see we can somehow do the radiation grafting by breaking the bonding at the surface or by allowing uh, either the cross linking or even uh, cleaning the surface or even inducing sterility to the surface we can utilize radiation grafting. So, in radiation grafting we can see it breaks the chemical bonds of the surface. So, whatever bonding is formed on the surface whether whatever it be it can start damaging the bond structure and it can uh, basically break the chemical bond of the surface and now that makes the surface highly reactive. Once the bonds have been broken it makes the surface highly reactive and all those reactive surfaces now can react with the free ra radicals and if we introduce certain monomer now they the free radicals will now interact with the introduced monomer. So, in the process we are activating the surface by breaking the chemical bonds they start reacting with a monomer which is now introduced in the system and that now results a very good bonding with the substrate. So, if you are able to activate the surface let it react with the monomer now it can bond very nicely or very strongly with the substrate and again by radiation grafting as I said earlier we can also control the ratio of hydrophilic or the hydrophobic ratio it can be easily controlled. So, we can always say which kind of specific uh, ratio of hydrophobicity to hydrophilicity we want to achieve in the system and now we can make it react with the specifically to a certain entity biologically. So, we can uh, attract a particular biological species with a particular hydrophobicity to hydrophilicity ratio and then that can be achieved by utilizing the radiation grafting because we can control uh, the overall radicals which are basically get getting broken in the kind of monomer it is reacting with. So, we can uh, control the hydrophilic and hydrophobic ratio. We can make a surface uh, coated with something and we can we can exactly control the regions where we are where we are breaking the bonds by uh, directing it and once we have done that we can let the monomer react to only those certain regions. So, in the process we have targeted the overall ratio of hydrophobic to hydrophilic content and that is how we can really control the overall functionality or the reactivity of the system to the adjoining environment. Again uh, so, in this process we can also see it can also bond hydrogels to hydrophobic polymers. So, we are seeing hydrogels they contain much water and hydrophobic polymers they are basically repellent to waters. So, we can even achieve the bonding of this hydrogels to the hydrophobic polymers. So, that is again an advantage which we can achieve from the radiation grafting because this is uh, this can essentially be utilized to break the bonds and now control the exact reaction of that particular surface with any other chemical entity it can be any monomer and now we can change the overall functionality of that particular surface because of the radiation grafting and we can even make hydrogels bond with the hydrophobic polymers. And then there is one more technique called radio frequency plasma deposition and uh, this is also called glow discharge. In this particular case uh, a low pressure ionized gas environment is maintained and in this process uh, we allow uh, ra high radio frequency to generate ionized gas and now it can modify the surfaces by either ablation or by etching and also it can be utilized for depositions. So, in this case also we can either sterilize we can either clean the surface we can even sterilize it or we can also utilize it for deposition. So, we can see that uh, radio frequency plasma deposition is also called, called a glow discharge process it can, it can be utilized for cleaning the surface even sterilizing the surface or even depositing a different material onto the its surface. So, it can easily modify the surfaces by either etching or ablation what it does is it, uh, it allows molecular diffusion to occur and once molecular diffusion is occurring it can allow the penetration of this particular uh, chemical species to go on to the substrate. So, we have substrate and this chemical entity now it can diffuse through the substrate as well and once you have this sort of intermixing it will lead to a very good addition. So, surface coating whatever is getting deposited on the substrate it can impart very good addition with the substrate material. One more advantage is that complex geometries can also be coated it is basically doing nothing but we can uh, also uh, incorporate com complex geometries 
and also it is uh, the coating itself is free of voids it can have unique chemistry it can also act as a very good barrier and again it can be deposited on any surface that is one more advantage of this radio frequency glow discharge that we can utilize it for uh, depositing in any on any surface and also uh, this radio frequency plasma deposition it also produces coatings which are sterile in nature that is one more advantage of the radio frequency plasma deposition that whatever coatings we are producing they are sterile so that is the advantage of uh, this uh, radio frequency plasma deposition so in this case what we are doing we are modifying the surface we are also cleaning it we can also etch or ablate the surface we can also utilize it for deposition and since it is, it, it uh, renders molecular diffusion it can it can provide very good addition of the coating with the substrate in this case we can uh, allow uh, very complex geometries to be incorporated and since the, because of its high energy it can uh, it can render uh, very uh, coatings which are free of voids they can have a very unique chemistry they can also act as a good barrier films and they can get deposited on any surface and since it is utilizing again breaking the bond and uh, utilizing radio frequency the coatings which are produced which they are sterile so they can be directly used in any biomedical application because they are already sterile in nature so that is the advantage of radio frequency plasma deposition now there are certain uh, kind of films which are called langmuir bloggett films so in this case uh, these uh, basically form uh, they are very highly highly ordered layer so in this case we introduce a particular uh, a particular fluid then we deposit a certain uh, species uh, to it and they tend to arrange very systematically on the top surface of it uh, but in this case we need to keep the concentration of this particular species much below below to that of a missile concentration if it is above the missile concentration then they go on they go to tend uh, they tend to form missiles uh, the, it means that all the polar head groups will combine as one and the other hydrophilic uh, uh, tails will basically be protruding out so in order to maintain this particular ge uh, geometries that they are uh, aligned uh, equi spaced uh, with each other we need to uh, keep the concentration very very low and in process what we can do if we have a uh, some sort of a barrier layer and we start pushing this particular regime we can control the overall distance between the chains and in process we can also control the porosity because porosity is nothing but the distance or the gap between the two so if we somehow compress them we can uh, reduce the porosity between them and since it is nothing but the electrostatic attraction we can uh, uh, electrostatic attraction they will tend to organize very near to each other so uh, that is that is the reason it, will, it might impart it very high degree of uniformity so we can see that uh, langmuir bloggett film they have a polar head and they have a non polar head so polar head is basically out here and non polar head is uh, sitting on the top and again it provide a high degree of uh, order and uniformity and again stability can be improved by cross linking if we somehow cross link them cross link uh, all these chains with, with each other we can improve its stability and if you want to coat it what we'll do we'll just start pressing it and we'll start lifting this particular substrate so in the process all these heads will start getting deposited so we'll have this head we should start sitting onto its surface so we start just compressing it and lifting it so that in process we can get a coating on this particular substrate so we this have this substrate and this is the overall coating which will form on the particular substrate so langmuir bloggett films they are highly ordered layers they are polar heads plus non polar regions uh, they have, they they can render very high degree of order and uniformity and if you want to further improve its uh, stability we may just cross link all of them and then it will result a very stable langmuir bloggett film there is also called something called self assembled uh, mono layers and these mono layers they get spontaneously formed as very high ordered structures uh, they have very strong exo strong exothermic adsorption once they get start anchoring and that provides the surface filling because they make the surface very very stable so as soon as a particular entity comes and sets it will release certain heat and this exothermic adsorption will now make them very very stable uh, again there is second order of attraction that is called vanderwall attraction between those uh, between all those uh, alkyl chains and as soon as they start coming uh, together it is better if they have some sort of attraction 
and that makes them organize very strongly or very nicely and very nicely spaced uh, and provide crystallinity as well. So, we, get, we can also get very good crystallinity if they have a very good van der Waal attraction which is uh, existent between those particular chains. So, they can provide very good chemical stability as well. So, in the self assembled monolayer it is more, more or less, more or less uh, a chemical reaction what is happening on the surface and they form they tend to form uh, very high order structures uh, because they can uh, exit uh, they can uh, uh, basically give out certain heat or exothermic adsorption. So, once they anchor they release much energy and they can become much more stable. Secondly, the chains they themselves can have some sort of van der Waal attraction of alkyl chains and that brings them to much closer proximity and leads to the overall nice arrangement or the uh, or induces the crystallinity of the alkyl chains. So, once they have a good uh, interaction between them they can organize very nicely in very nice fashion and it will lead to the crystallization of the alkyl, alkyl chains and in the process it can give it out very good chemical stability both because of chemical bonding and secondly because of the van der Waal attraction force which is predominant between the alkyl chains. In the second category of the surface uh, coating or th uh, inducing thin films, we have something called surface modifying additives. So, in this case we add low concentration of uh, this particular material in bulk which now emerges, emerges at the surface. So, such as in uh, just to give an example if we take a polyurethane matrix bulk and we have certain chains which have polyurethane head and PDMS uh, chain group. So, we have polyurethane of a head this material also is polyurethane. So, if we induce, induce this particular material into the polyurethane matrix we can expect polyurethane to have good compatibility with itself polyurethane whereas PDMS finds much more suitability once it is now being hanging outside in the air or with certain entity. So, we can see either it can get merged out here. So, this is nothing but PDMS sorry this one is polyurethane which is the head groups are polyurethane and the tail groups are PDMS which are just basically hanging out of the polyurethane matrix. So, now it can impart hydrophobicity to this particular surface. So, we can see polyurethane it can now impart very high degree of uh, very high degree of hydrophobicity on the surface. So, in this case we can see we, can, we are adding PDMS in very low quantity in bulk which now automatically emerges at the top or the surface because now PDMS is a very high interface of a polyurethane. So, in process it will try to go to the surface and now form a surface with either air or the fluid around it. So, in that case it will try to reduce the interfacial energy and in the process it will also impart certain functionality to, to the surface. And the mobility of additive in the bulk is decided by the overall rate of covering the surface and also the interfacial energy which is predominant between the polyurethane and the PDMS and PDMS and the outside environment. And again the interfacial energy with additive must be higher. If it is not higher then it will basically remain in the bulk and it will not come to the surface. So, that the additive can be mobilized to reach the surface. So, in the particular example we have seen that polyurethane and PDMS once they are inserted in a PU block will bring PDMS on the surface. So, in the surface modifying additives we add uh, a particular entity in a low, lower concentration in bulk and in process it, it, the overall interfacial energy of the additive must be higher. So, that it can be mobilized to reach the surface and impart certain functionality and the mobility of additive in bulk that decides the overall rate of covering or coverage of the surface. If mobility of additive is very very poor the overall entire surface may not get covered properly. So, mobility of this particular entity is very very slow. It might happen that only a few will be able to reach the surface and that is it, it will not cover the surface. But if the mobility of this uh, particular additive is very very high then only it will be able to cover the entire surface completely. And that interfacial uh, energy with the additive must be higher. So, that the overall additive can be mobilized nicely and then it can cover the entire surface and impart certain functionality to the surface. A good example is uh, polyurethane and PDMS combination once it is being inserted into the polyurethane block it will bring the PDMS on the surface and will cover the entire surface. 
again there are some class of uh, coatings which are called conversion coatings and in conversion coatings uh, we can uh, somehow introduce the uh, we can somehow oxidize the surface layer and uh, surface layer of a metal and we oxidize it and form a oxide rich layer such as uh, such examples are titanium and aluminum if we start oxidizing them we, we can form TiO2 or Al2O3 and now these particular entities are very good in terms of uh, inducing either addition introducing lubricity or providing corrosion resistance and these coatings are generally transparent once very very thin up to 50 angstrom they can be even made thicker so, uh, up to even 5 micrometer but as soon as we start increasing the thickness it start it can even get damaged because of the stresses which are induced between the sub substrate and the uh, generated coating but in both the cases titanium and aluminum this coatings are pretty thin and they were adherent to the substrate, sub substrate surface so we can see in conversion coating we let a metal surface to get oxidized so we form a very dense oxide and dense oxide is acts more like a barrier and it, it, it imparts the res resistance to the substrate material it, uh, it can also induce some lubricity by uh, in this particular manner it can also induce some sort of adhesion and these coatings are generally transparent up when they are they can be even between 50 angstroms or 5 nanometer to 5 micrometer in thickness then there is a last class of uh, coatings which is called pyrene, uh, uh, pyrene coatings and these are more, more or less like very uh, good insulating coatings and moisture barrier uh, they have very good moisture barrier properties as well what pyrene coating involves is it involves simultaneous vaporization pyrolization and polymerization and then deposition of this diapara xylene so we have this diapara xylene we do uh, simultaneous vaporization its pyrolization and its polymerization to finally deposit this particular coating which are called pyrrolein coatings and they possess very good electrical insulation as well as good moisture barrier properties so then uh, so these are basically certain chemical coatings which are required to get deposit to to which are basically deposited on the surface of a particular biomaterial or a device material and again uh, there is uh, something called laser surface engineering it is uh, it utilizes laser that's nothing but light amplification amplification by stimulated emission of radiation so we utilize laser for somehow in engineering the surface and the advantage of laser is we can precisely control the overall frequency the density the focusing and even the rastering so we can select a particular regime with particular energy with particular uh, density with uh, with a particular focus uh, to impart certain functional functionality to the surface so we can precisely control all these parameters of what all sort of energy we want to introduce what all density we want to impart whether it should be focused or defocused or even how to raster or pro, pro, or form certain geometries or certain surface topography we can form certain surface uh, uh, contours to uh, on this particular surface for providing certain functionality and again heating and excitation can be utilized to change uh, we can pulse the source and control the reaction time so we can uh, we can provide certain heating and excitation for changing the chemistry we can also pulse the source and control the reaction time so we can precisely see in what time this particular reaction will go to completion so what all chemistries we want to re retain on the surface and what sort of functionality we want to provide to the surface there are certain uh, lasers which are very very common which are uh, neodymium yag which is called yttrium get, uh, aluminum and garnet laser argon laser and uh, co2 laser and which are basically very commonly used uh, they also include uh, they include annealing etching deposition and polymerization so we can utilize laser for either, either annealing the surface etching the surface out so by etching we can provide certain uh, contours and geometries to the particular material we can also deposit certain materials or certain chemicals on the surface of the substrate we can also induce cross linking or polymerization by utilizing uh, lasers so laser surface engineering has emerged as a, uh, a as a wide tool in terms of precisely controlling the frequency density focus and rastering so in uh, in that particular manner we can provide heating and excitation to the material for either changing the chemistry for controlling the chemistry for providing a particular reaction time so we can uh, exactly control the overall chemicals which will be basically being retained on the surface or the kind of reaction which should 
uh, which should be is we should be, which we should should be able to control. So the overall reaction time can be controlled. The degree of reaction can also be controlled by uh, properly engineering the laser surface uh, by using uh, by engineering the laser. And there are certain lasers which are very very common: neodymium, uh, yttrium, aluminum, garnet, aluminum, and CO2 laser, carbon dioxide. And they include all uh, all these sort of things. We can all uh, anneal the surface to remove the sur certain surface stresses. We can etch the surface to provide much more physical uh, area or to en enhance the activity by uh, by providing certain roughness to it. We can uh, do deposition, so we can provide uh, uh, any coating or any sort of uh, surface uh, action to it. And then we can also polymerize the surface, or we can also induce cross-linking. So in summary, we can see that the overall surface modification uh, it becomes a must for retaining the bulk properties while rendering certain biological compatibility. So surface modification is highly essential because we want to retain the bulk properties or the bulk mechanical and the functional properties, uh, but rendering the surface or the biological compatibility, compatibility becomes essential. So we provide with a thin film coating or a grafting to improve the interaction of this particular device or implant material with the surrounding tissues or environment. So in process, we are enhancing the performance of this particular device or the implant material. It can be in terms of wear, corrosion, we can impart uh, coatings of diamond, we can impart certain coatings, uh, barrier coatings to improve the wear and corrosion resistance. We can also in induce certain barrier uh, performance, we can, uh, we can uh, have some barrier layers, we can enhance the blood compatibility. We can also induce, uh, increase the permeability such as in homeodialysis, we want the oxygen to go through, but again the surface has to remain corrosion resistant, so we can, uh, we can impart certain functionality or improve the performance by, uh, by incorporating the surface coating, thin films and grafting. Again we can provide these coatings or thin films by techniques such as radi radiation grafting. So we can either utilize uh, cobalt 60, UV radiation or electron beam radiation to control uh, the overall structure, we can clean the surface, we can sterilize the surface or we can also do the deposition utilizing all these techniques. We also have plasma deposition or also called the glow discharge technique. We, we can also utilize Langmuir blocket films. We can add surface additives which, which are incorporated into the bulk of the material and they tend to come on the surface uh, because of the mobility of this particular additive. Uh, since the energy or the interface energy of this additive is much uh, higher with the uh, with with, uh, with the bulk material, so it can have certain mobility and it can come on the surface and impart certain functionality. Then we have self-assembled monolayers, we can also have conversion coatings and we can also have laser surfacing. So in the process we are allowing the chemical species to come, interact the surface and provide a very good bonding while also inducing some sort of a interaction, electrostatic interaction between the chains to stabilize the surface coatings and make it very, very stable. We can have conversion coatings in which we can allow the oxidation of the surface, metallic surface and, uh, and induce much more corrosion resistance or a barrier nature of the film, even up impart lubricity. And again we can uh, have surface uh, sur laser surfacing or laser engineering to coat the particular, to coat a particular surface and somehow control the cross-linking or polymerization of the surface and retain or provide certain. Uh, gradient in terms of the overall functionality. It can be hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity or even certain barrier nature, corrosion resistance, even deposition of the films. So in the process we realize that how important is the surface coating or thin films or grafting to impart the interaction between the device and implant material with the surrounding body without uh, hampering the overall mechanical functionality of the device or the implant material. Thank you.